What we're concerned with is that control panel interface. Uh, if, if you watch this, uh, you, re you remember that Homer Simpson works in the nuclear power plant. He's always got his feet kicked up on the control panel, eating a donut and everything. He just switches and engages and dials and things like that. And uh, that's sort of an old school human machine interface for a critical infrastructure system or any type, kind of control system. The photo that you see there is from Three Mile Island. Uh, back in the day, and anything you have actual physical switches and dials and gauges. You may have some of this now and anything, but it's probably being fed uh, data a little bit differently than this is, rather than a little more indirectly. Uh, now, you're much more likely to see uh, LCD panels, touch screens, um, workstations set up uh, with graphical interfaces for, or the, uh, for the control systems that you're manipulating. The, the one at the bottom there is actually a, from a demo system. It's a, a, a cookie factory. I like that one. That's definitely critical infrastructure. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the interfaces for these, they, they, if you've been around for a while, then you probably realize these look very much like uh, uh, visual basic style interfaces. These look very much like programmer art, uh, as you would call them, uh, where uh, the, the, the skills of the graphical artist are not consulted. Uh, but the idea with this sort of interface is, and this sort of software really is, is that uh, there's no cookie factory HMI product that you can buy, pop into your system, and it automatically start making cookies for you. Uh, there's no uh, drop-in software for controlling your computer power plant. These things have to be kind of custom written per client, per stakeholder. So there are companies out there that are basically solutions providers that buy the HMI software, code up all the interface, code up all the, the background code that runs behind that, and uh, deploys it out to the, uh, to the end users. Uh, an interesting aspect of that is that when you find a vulnerability in the HMI software, the vendors don't necessarily know who their end users are. They know who their solutions providers that are buying the products are, but they don't know who the end users are. Because what you're doing is you're buying essentially an IDE that lets you develop these sorts of interfaces. Another cool thing about that is that if you want to play around with this sort of software, they are very generous. Most vendors are very generous about giving out demonstration versions that you can use. And those demonstration versions typically have very, very loose restrictions on them because they want you to learn how to use their software to develop solutions. They want you to tie into that and then recommend that to clients. Uh, HMI is part of the attack surface for control systems. Uh, these sorts of systems, uh, there's increased connectivity in control systems for building and process improvement type purposes. Uh, there are HMI products for cell phones and tablets and things like that now. There's a, famously, I've seen uh, an ad from the Control Systems magazine that shows an engineer sitting on a mountaintop with their laptop remotely accessing you know, whatever water treatment plant there is. Uh, it was supposed to be a, an advertisement that you, know, you can be on vacation and still manage all the critical stuff that you're responsible for, but in reality it's just terrifying. Um, I put insider threats here because most of the stuff that I'm going to show you today, this is not, it's not remotely exploitable necessarily. Uh, some of it, it, in some situations, could be. But what you're mainly looking at here is an insider threat. So uh, if you look at the uh, Stuxnet attacks and anything, uh, those, that, that, that uh, Stuxnet moved around by USB. And so uh, you could have insiders that are moving those USBs around uh, intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, and basically popping air gaps. These air gaps, oftentimes the air gap isn't really there, and even when it is there, it's not something that's insurmountable. So, uh, so, and then a lot of times the, the end user, the end client, doesn't even know uh, uh, basically that there is, whether or not there is an air gap. Not. They think there's an air gap, but as it turns out, well, you ask them, so what happens when the system breaks? Well, we call our solutions provider, and, uh, and, and they fix it. Well, did they come on site and fix it? No, they do it right over. <laughs> so, uh, so if we look at HMI security features, some of these products don't advertise any sort of security features. So it's a control panel software, or it runs locally, you can use it locally, and it talks out to, to whatever devices it's going to talk out to, and that's it. And 
I don't really pick on this because it's not claiming to do anything. Uh, but there are a lot of these patches that claim some security functionality. Uh, primarily, the security functionality uh, that is uh, advertised on these products is the identification and authentication of users. There's usually some very nitty good, complex systems for or having multiple layers of access, uh, uh, different access levels, uh, everybody from the Homer Simpson guy sitting at the, uh, at the power plant and anything at the control panels, all the way up to the engineers that can actually change the code on things and modify the HMI. Um, the idea behind this is to take the integrity of the HMI project, that the project being the entirety of the user interface's code around it, uh, preventing modification of the HMI software itself, and locking in the users into a captive kiosk interface. Uh, on a previous vulnerability, I asked one of the developers, or I was talking to one of the developers about the, 